Hi, I'm Julie Urban, and I'm going to welcome to Spotted Lanternfly. Um, there's certainly a, a great deal of research being conducted on Spotted Lanternfly at Penn State. And today, though, I'd like to share with you three areas in particular. One is an area-wide, you know, field-based insecticide efficacy study that took place at Blue Marsh, which is an area near Reading, Pennsylvania. And then I'd like to share some studies on spotted lanternfly development and reproduction and other ways we're using basic biology to improve detection and monitoring. And so I chose these three areas of research to share because they reflect two work, uh, two features of the work that Penn State's doing on lanternfly that I think are really important. And the first is that um, the work that we're doing is really highly relevant and responsive to the constantly changing problem that is spotted lanternfly. Um, as member, you know, members of the scientific working group, we meet every other week, but um, Dean Roush, Dennis Calvin, and I meet weekly with USDA and PDA folks, Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture folks, who are working to control lanternfly. And so we're trying to um, help do research to respond to that, the changing needs. And I think certainly that's what the Blue Marsh study demonstrates. But also, the other thing that really strikes me is that um, work being done at Penn State is highly integrative across areas of research that would traditionally be considered basic versus applied. I mean, I'm an evolutionary biologist who studies the natural history of plant hoppers. I mean, you couldn't really come up with a more basic area of applied research. But as I'm seeing um, the lanternfly work emerge, I, I'm realizing that it's kind of a false dichotomy to characterize basic versus applied research. I mean, bottom line, you need fundamental knowledge in order to use it to solve real problems. And, and that's what I hope to show to you in these other in these other studies. So first, let's start with, you know, what is the spotted lanternfly situation right now? And if we look at this map, we can see this is the current distribution of lanternfly. Those blue areas are areas under quarantine in multiple states, uh, 26 counties in, in Pennsylvania, where we have established spotted lanternfly populations. The purple spots show you where individual detections have been um, found. So it shows lanternfly as a really good hitchhiker. Um, it pop ups, pops up everywhere. It's not known to be established in those places yet. Uh, but but the, the, the problem here is that, you know, we're seeing within our state um, lanternfly in Philadelphia. Uh, and so we also have this little blue area over here, our established populations on Staten Island in New York City. And so as we're seeing spotted lanternfly essentially move into the major urban centers of the eastern seaboard, uh, that's really problematic for possibility for spread. And so up until this point, um, Pennsylvania's uh, governmental efforts to control lanternfly and the federal way to approach lanternfly control has been, you know, it's been challenging because you have an insect that feeds on over 70 different species of trees and plants across different habitats, residential areas, agricultural areas, you know, urban areas. And so you really can't spray everything. And so basically what they wanted to do is, and what they've done is focus on treating tree of heaven one of spotted lanternflies um, highly preferred host and a ubiquitous tree because itself is in an introduced invasive and, and all over the place, especially living in disturbed habitats. And so they've targeted tree of heaven with an insecticide um, named, they're called dinotefuran, which is basically when it gets applied to the tree, the tree absorbs it. And then the insect, when it feeds upon the sap in the tree, it poisons it. Um, so they've been targeting tree of heaven with that insecticide and also targeting it with herbicides just to take the tree out. But what's been apparent in our conversations with USDA and, and just looking at the spread is that that's not enough. USDA wants more tools in their toolkit. And so they want to try methods that take more of an area-wide approach where you're treating all vegetation in a certain area. And they were interested in, in doing aerial applications, but they can't change their toolkit and apply new tools until they know if they're going to work. And so this is where Penn State really stepped in and said, hey, we'll test these, the, some of these approaches in, in a real field-based study. And so um, this was done with a number of, of colleagues uh, in the College of Agriculture, led by our Extension Educator, Brian Walsh. 
um, but Dean Rausch has been very active in it, uh, Dennis Calvin has and whatnot. And because these lands are managed by US Army Corps of Engineer and Pennsylvania Game Commission, they worked highly collaboratively with us and Army Corps of Engineer actually had volunteers that helped as well. So this is a, a, a real community-based pro project. And so this was done this, this summer and in taking this area-wide approach, um, what they're doing is they're applying insecticide to all vegetation in a certain area. So part of the test was to look at ground-based applications. So here you can see John Rost um, spraying from the ground all, all vegetation in a certain area versus an aerial application where an insecticide would be applied from uh, an airplane or a helicopter. And here USDA expressed interest in wanting to um, do aerial applications when it expands its management approach. Um, and, and so that would be really, you know, when you have a pop-up area, if Lanternfly shows up in California, if you could use an aerial application, you can treat a large area and knock down that new pop-up. Or, you know, you might be able to treat a woodlot adjacent to some vineyards or other high-risk properties. But we weren't necessarily convinced. It's, it's not clear that an aerial application will necessarily be effective. We know that lanternfly lays, lays their egg cases. Some are up in the canopy, but we don't know if you spray, you know, are you knocking down the population enough for those nymphs that do remain in the canopy? Because certainly we see nymphs down below, you know, or can an aerial application actually penetrate? So that was one question, you know, aerial versus ground applications, which would be more effective. And then there, we're also interested in testing two EPA registered um, products that use a fungal pathogen, Bavaria bassiana, that essentially sprays spores on the insects. And this is thought to be a little bit safer for, for native insects in terms of non-target impacts. And so the spores hit lanternfly and then the pathogen grows and sporulates and you see your fuzzy little dead lanternfly from Bavaria growth here. And so two products um, using this, this pathogen were, were used um, in comparison to dinotefuran, that's what I had mentioned the government is, is currently using that um, gets absorbed by the plants and the trade name for that product that was used is Safari. And so here, let me show you a video showing that aerial application this year out of Blue Marsh. Okay, and so concerning uh, that first question, aerial versus ground application, you know, can aerial work? Aerial work? And so here, when we look at um, just the, the Safari, the Dinotefuron product, um, and look at the number of nymphs that were counted and recorded in plots after the applications, um, you can see that in both the Safari air and the Safari ground, um, those applications knock down populations. So it seemed to be really effective in, in knocking out nymphs. And um, interestingly, the safari air was even more effective than safari ground. So that shows that, you know, aerial applications could be really effective against spotted lanternfly. So that's great. Um, concerning the, the Bavaria-based products, those were actually applied in three different, at three different times. And so that's a little bit more of a, of a complex story and the data are still being analyzed for that. Um, very, very preliminary data suggests that 
you know, in this study, because it was applied to early instars, so starting at first instars, it seems that it was a bit less effective than when um, this, this Bavaria compound was applied last year in a study done in Norristown Town Park near Philadelphia to later stage NIFs. So that suggests that um, Bavaria products really aren't a silver bullet. Um, they're potent, but there really is not going to be a silver bullet for spotted lanternfly, but it's potentially another tool for the toolkit. But basically, we need to further optimize it in order to gain maximum efficacy. And so the timing, so basically, in order to maximize the efficacy of not just Bavaria, but really any uh, control measure against lanternfly, really needs to um, be taught be timed appropriately because these insects move and feed on different things so much across their different developmental stages. And so this is where we get to the next study, um, pretty much uh, understanding and being able to predict development is, is what sounds like very basic research, but it is highly useful when managing this pest. And so my grad student, Erica Smyers, um, was working on, on developing degree day models uh, with with much help from Dennis Calvin. And so if we think about just like in um, agriculture where we use growing degree days to allow us to predict the growth of agricultural plants, we can apply that same approach to insect growth. And so basically out in um, Oli in the quarantine region, um, Erica uh, observed and, and checked daily hatch and temperature across over 100 egg cases over the course of, of that, that spring and early summer field season. And, and then using eggs that she and all of us collected in the field, uh, she, the, she um, exposed them to constant temperatures under different temperature regimes in growth chambers in my spotted quarantine, spotted lanternfly quarantine lab you can tell this is the fourth presentation. I'm getting all jumbled here. Um, basically, growing them in, under controlled conditions in the lab, she was able to come up with predictive models of growth as a function, hatch and growth as a function of temperature, and was able to then use those, you know, to validate them against field data collected from the Oli site and from data collected in Virginia to come up with predictive models for hatch and actually those have been put together into this pest watch app that anybody can go online and, and get predictions for their area for spotted lanternfly hatch. And that was what was used in order to predict hatch for the timing of applications of insecticide out at Blue Marsh. And so kind of going beyond that here, um, work that I'm doing uh, is, is focusing on later aspects of development, and that's female reproductive development. And so in the lower left, you can see we have two females here. One is very small and black, and here we can see uh, a female that has her abdomen is greatly expanded because her eggs are developing and she's developing more body mass. And so just to show you how much they grow, last year I took live weights of a number of individuals out in a vineyard, and we can see that over the course of five weeks, males and females put on a lot of weight, but females um, increase their mass by over 50%. And so with that, what I care about, I'm gonna have to talk about this quickly here, I got slow in the fourth, pre fourth presentation. Um, as these females are developing their eggs, they also have bacteria that they house in organs, which is pretty cool, that those bacteria essentially feed the insects from the inside out. And so you can dissect out a female and you can see these bacteria are housed in these special organs. And if you look at them at different stages in female reproductive development, uh, the shape and the position of these uh, bacteria housing organs changes over time because the bacteria have to proliferate and move into the developing insect eggs. And so, I, you know, I'm interested in trying to interrupt that transmission. And when I then started to look, what do we know about internal anatomy of spotted lanternfly? And at basically what we have is one paper from 1934 <laughs> that shows internal anatomy of spotted lanternflies. So basically what I've been doing is dissecting females and characterizing the stages of their reproductive development. On the top left, we see an early stage female with not very well developed eggs versus down in these lower pictures, much, much more developed eggs. And we see a spermatophore, that's what the male passes to the female. And, and to me, what I thought was very basic research looking at endosymbionts and endosymbiont transmission 
um, is something that also has an application in that we need degree day models for it. So I'm working with Dennis Calvin and we're working to develop degree day models to look at and predict the timing of mating and egg laying in lanternfly in lanternfly development because that will be important and have important implications for where they're able to um, whether or not they're mated and how much they're at risk for mo moving into new areas and so i think i will stop i'm also looking at the endosymbionts here because the endosymbionts do get transmitted into the eggs so we're looking to apply different compounds to interrupt that as well but again I try to give you examples here just to reflect how basic and applied research go hand in hand to solve practical problems with lanternfly.